Okay. All right. So everybody's on mute right now, and that's um, that's by design. So that um, so that Adam uh, or Dr. Kennedy can go ahead and get started here. Um, we're going to wait uh, a couple more minutes. It looks like we're still having people join, so I don't want to get started too quickly um, here um, and have people miss out. Um, but good morning. I hope you guys are all doing well and safe. Um, and if you have anything uh, that you want to ask, uh, put it into the chat room that I just uh, like I just typed, um, and we'll try to get to those questions um, maybe at the end or if it fits in with what Dr. Chang is talking about, we can maybe he'll choose to answer it then. So, um, but we'll go ahead and get started here in about uh, three or four more minutes. Just kind of give people a chance to join. If it seems like people are done joining. We'll go ahead and get started sooner. So, Sounds good. Okay. All right. <sighs> I'm gonna get my caffeine in in the morning here. <laughs> All right. Um, you think the top left would be the best spot to put the video of you? Uh, yeah. Um, top left. Yeah, I think it should be fine. Okay. I'm All just right. gonna check some other things. Um, okay, so that works as well. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I can move you around as the things come up too. Um, all right, why don't you go ahead and get started here? All right, sounds good. So hi everyone, my name's Adam. Um, I'm a graduate uh, from high school. I graduated back in 2009 and uh, thanks uh, you guys for joining me. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Baltimore classification of viruses and um, the current ongoing pandemic of SARS-CoV-2. So, Given that this is for your guys' uh, education, half of it will kind of be kind of lecture-based material where I go into the nitty-gritty of virology and uh, give you some facts about viruses. And then the other half, I hope to have it to be informative about the current, uh, the current um, environment. And so hopefully you'll take away some of it. I don't know if you'll learn uh, or retain the information about the viruses, but hopefully you'll, you'll learn something interesting about um, the pandemic and um, have information moving forward. And um, before I move forward, feel free to interact. I hope this will be fun. I hope it will be inter interesting. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time, um, or you can wait until the end. You can chat it like um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Grebo said. Um, Wish us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so about me. Um, so I attended from high school in 2005. To 2009 and so if you look here um, this one is me um, back then we didn't have very good cameras so you can probably see a couple hundred pixels but that that was me um, I liked AP bio uh, I had Mr. Graba for teach I also liked chemistry uh, have Craddock and math uh, with uh, Mrs. Spears uh, she's retired now and I did like um, pretty typical things uh, like math team, chess team, foreign exchange, uh, went to Germany for a little bit. That was a lot of fun. Um, after graduating, I decided to go to Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I was there for uh, four years, uh, majored in math and biology, uh, kind of reflecting what I liked in high school, uh, the biology and math part specifically. Um, I also really got interested in anthropology. And so uh, for those of you unfamiliar, that's kind of the study of human behavior. And um, I was particularly interested and how humans and how different cultures experience medicine and treat uh, patients. And so um, that's kind of the background on anthropology. I did a couple of things uh, like Global Brigades, which is a global medicine uh, club. We went to developing nations and um, treat patients there. I uh, joined a fraternity, did some social justice issues with Connect4. Uh, I taught, did some research. And kind of with all of these uh, uh, interest. I, I knew I would wanted to do medicine, but uh, after I got involved in research, I was uh, really intrigued by how we can improve um, our medical treatment uh, through research. And so that's when I decided to join an MD-PhD program um, that is combining both uh, medicine and research. So here's uh, kind of my first day in the lab doing uh, virology research. Um, and then I, in my free time, I also uh, teach, do some running, cooking, board games, um, and catching up on sleep recently. 
So I'm almost done. I'll talk about kind of the career path if you guys are interested uh, later in the PowerPoint. But that's kind of me on one slide. So let's get into the information. So this lecture is about, or half the lecture is about the uh, Baltimore classification of viruses. So what is taxonomy? Um, so if you guys want, we can make this interactive so you guys can unmute yourself and participate, or I can just kind of um, talk through it all, uh, whichever ones you guys prefer. Um, does anyone have a, a, their own idea or a definition of taxonomy? And if you guys don't want to chat, if it's too early, that's also fine. Somebody just joined. Okay. All right. So taxonomy has changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, this is kind of just pulled from Wikipedia. Um, but basically, it's the science of naming, defining, um, and classifying groups of uh, biological organisms on the basis of shared characteristics. So uh, Mr. Graber said that you guys went through a couple of um, these lectures. And so uh, you guys are probably familiar with the species, genus, family order, et cetera. Um, and I think the, there's like a nice mnemonic uh, King Philip something. I actually don't remember the yeah, name. Yeah, came over for green soup or uh, all kinds yeah, of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, in my mind, um, I kind of rationalized the goals of taxonomy into identifying and classifying organisms so that we clump or, uh, similar organisms together. Um, and then a secondary feature that I think is pretty important is predicting the features and functions of an organism if we know what they kind of belong in. And so if we have two organisms that belong in the same um, genus or same family, then um, I can infer that they have similar functions. So an example of this. So I know nothing about fungi, so um, that's uh, uh, just a heads up, but there's basically seven phyla of uh, fungi uh, that I grabbed from the internet. And so if I knew that uh, species belong into ascomycota, that is they have ascus with ascospores, which apparently are these things where they have ascospores, a small sac, and the, the individual spores are the as ascus or asci. If I knew an organism belonged to um, this phyla, then I could predict that, uh, for example, if I were to buy morel mushrooms online, um, that they would also produce um, asci with ascospores. So, with that in mind, um, what, how do we apply this to viruses? Um, the International Committee of Taxonomy of Viruses also has a similar nomenclature, and that is they use a similar um, concept of realms, kingdoms, phyla, class, order, et cetera. But in kind of day-to-day -day virology, um, we don't really use all, all of these. The ones that we mostly focus on are orders, families, subfamilies, genus, and species. Um, and to be honest, like most of the time, we don't even usually use orders or subfamilies very often. Usually we just focus on family, genus, and species. So an example of this is um, HIV-1 and 2. Those are the species of human immunodeficiency virus 1 and 2. They belong to the genus lentivirus, uh, meaning that they infect primates from the prefix lenti. And they're in the family of retroviridae, uh, meaning that they use reverse transcriptase. And the main takeaway from this is that, um, one is that usually species are named by their disease. Um, and then we usually refer to the genus and family level um, of nomenclature. A couple of other examples are, for example, poliovirus uh, is a species. Um, it belongs uh, to the genus Enterovirus. And, um, the family Picornoviridae. Now, some, some uh, viruses don't fall specifically into this. And an example of that is influenza virus. So influenza A is the species, or you can have B virus, C virus, et cetera. Um, but there's even more specific classifications. In this case, there's different stereotypes. H1N1, H5N1. I'm sure you guys have heard about uh, these various influenza outbreaks in the news. Um, OK. so. Adam, why are you talking about all this? This is the same as everything you learned in class, right? And this is the same as for organisms, for cats, dogs, 
for bacteria. Um, why are you getting a separate lecture? Well, the main thing is that for viruses, there's an ever-growing list of species being discovered. So these are just uh, numbers uh, published on how many viruses were known back in 2012 and 2018. And you can see that there's almost a doubling of species, a uh, doubling of genera, almost a doubling of, more than a doubling of subfamilies and almost a doubling of families. So the reason for this is the uh, technology for sequencing viruses has become extremely efficient and cheap. And so here's a paper published in 2014 and the title of this, so this is an academic paper published in a peer reviewed journal. It's what's for dinner, meta uh, and genomics of US store bought beef, pork, and chicken. So all they did was they went to the store, they bought beef, pork, and chicken, and they sequenced it for viruses. And they identified several different types of novel viruses, um, several species of gyrovirus, um, of pork, virus found um, in beef samples, so suggesting there's contamination, uh, a whole nother species. And so the main thing I'm trying to get across is that the field of virology is uh, expanding exponentially, especially in the last decade with the advancements of technology. And so memorizing all of these different uh, genuses and families and species for viruses is kind of complicated. And it's not the easiest to remember. And so the question is, is there an easier way? Can we get away from this hierarchy of realms, orders, families, genera, species, and go into a functional classification of viruses? Um, and the answer is yes. But before I jump into uh, kind of the main talk, which is the Baltimore classification, um, I want to kind of go through a timeline of the central dogma. I think it's important to have a good background and understanding of where we came from and where we're going. So just some brief information and in roughly the 40s, every um, uh, kind of proposed ideas that uh, DNA um, were the fundamental component of genes. Um, in 53, we know, of course, uh, that was the discovery of the structure of DNA and the proposed uh, double helix model by uh, Watson and Crick. And in 58, uh, Crick proposed the central dogma, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then we get the concept of mRNA by Party, Jacob, Minot, and then the concept of the codon uh, by Nuremberg in 61. Um, so the important thing is uh, kind of all of these happen very shortly in a span of two or so decades. Um, and importantly, Crick proposed the central dogma without really the entire knowledge of, uh, found the, uh, knowledge of biology that we know today. And he states, so this is from uh, a paper in 58, he states that uh, once information has passed into a protein, it cannot get out again. I think this is a fundamental um, part of the central dogma. That is, you can go from DNA to RNA to protein, you can go from RNA to protein, you can potentially go from DNA to protein, um, or even uh, DNA to DNA, RNA to RNA, but you can't ever go from protein back to DNA or RNA. Um, and so this model of the central dogma is actually still correct today. Um, some of these parts are hypothetical, so you can see there's a dashed line from RNA to DNA. So at that time of 58, this um, was potentially hypothetical, um, and these um, were not entirely known either. Uh, but mainly, you can't go from protein to DNA or protein to RNA. And so another way of thinking about this, again published by Crick and Nature, um, is this kind of a triangular diagram. So on the left is all the possible variants of DNA, RNA, protein. And of course, we know that not all of these can happen. And so what, pro, uh, what Crick says in the central dogma is that you can go kind of uh, counterclockwise, but you can never go from protein to RNA or protein to DNA. All right, so why do I need to know this? Um, or where does this lead us? So this leads us to the 1970s. And um, let's make this a little bit interactive. Does anyone know who any of these people are? Let's see. Some of them are still alive today. 
this might be a little bit tricky. It's a little bit old, this is like 40 years ago. Um, so from left to right, this is David Baltimore, Howard Temin, and Renato Del Becco. And so these three individuals uh, won the uh, 1975 Nobel Prize in uh, Medicine or Physiology. And the important um, summaries are listed here. So Temin, uh, the guy in the middle, um, he stated, or he postulated that genetic information of an RNA virus um, capable of giving transformation could be copied into DNA. So he proposed that RNA could be turned into DNA. And at that time, it was kind of radical because most people think of the central dogma as DNA to RNA to protein. And he proposed that this might not be true. You could probably go from RNA to DNA. And then from there, we can go from DNA to RNA to protein again. And then second, secondly, David Baltimore showed the occurrence of a specific enzyme in an RNA tumor virus particle, which could make DNA copy from RNA. And so anyone have any ideas what this specific enzyme might be referring to? Uh, they should. <laughs> Reverse transcriptase. There very good. Is. Thank you, uh, you said. Um, uh, that's very good. So we'll talk uh, a little bit about reverse transcriptase in uh, the next slide. And so basically they won the Nobel Prize for discovering this enzyme. First, Hemant uh, for proposing it and then Baltimore for discovering it. So uh, given that I'm a scientist, uh, I do experiments. Uh, I just want to run through a quick experiment that um, Baltimore did. So this is from his laboratory notebook. You can see it's dated May 4th, 1970. And I'll just kind of walk through some of this. Um, so the, hypo the hypothesis, it's not really listed here. Um, I, I don't think this is like a formal lab um, write-up or formal lab assignment that you would do in a biology class. This is just kind of the day-to-day -day lab notebook. But basically his hypothesis, what I assume, is that something is converting RNA to DNA. Given the timeline of 1970, given that Temin proposed kind of these ideas previously. Uh, this top part is a brief protocol of uh, making your reagent. So uh, this RMLV, this is a virus. So this is Rauscher mouse leukemia virus. Um, this is concentrated, and this is telling you how he concentrated it. So you spin down 10 milliliters of the uh, 1967 prep at, uh, I think, 40,000 RPMs for 30 minutes in a 65 rotor. So not entirely specific. If I, if I were to try to reproduce this, I don't really know what a 96 prep is, but this is for his use. Uh, and then you re-suspend in a minimum volume of PBS. So he's basically growing up virus and then concentrating it. And then he's using this virus for an assay. So what is this assay? So the assay is listed on the right. I, it took me like 10 minutes to read through this. So I don't expect you to read it. But uh, translated on the right is basically he's mixing deoxy ATP, deoxy CTP, deoxy GTP. So these are all the components of DNA, right? So deoxy, um, adenine, cytosine, guanine. But importantly, he's not using uh, deoxy CTP. He's not using thiamine. He's using the RNA equivalent. So this is just ribothiamine, um, and H3 is a, it's just a radio, radio label, but that part's not important right now. So he's mixing three of the components of DNA and then one component of RNA. Um, and then what he's doing is he's adding virus. So the question is, is perhaps something is converting RNA to DNA. And the question is, is that thing in the virus? And so uh, basically what he's trying to figure out is if I add virus to this mixture, can I get a production of uh, this DNA component, the deoxythiamine? And if there were no virus, if you were to have a normal replication in a eukaryotic cell, uh, you wouldn't be able to, right? There's no genome of an organism that completely lacks thymine. And there would be no way for you to undergo replication. Does that kind of make sense? So he's putting in the components of ATP, CTP, and GTP, but he's lacking one component. But he's giving you the building block. That is, he's giving you the RNA component. So he's mixing all these together and then you measure out whether or not you can get uh, the DNA component at zero minutes and 30 minutes. So the data is, uh, the results are listed kind of on the left. So in the first column, you can see that he's mixing everything together. He has your mix, you have deoxycytosine, deoxyguanine, and then he's adding some concentrated virus. And this is at time zero. 
so the readout is very little. So the readout is counts per minute. That's kind of the, um, how radioactive um, your compound is. So you get 109 uh, um, CPM. Um, but then at 30 minutes, you get uh, 600, so almost a six-fold increase. Um, and then he changed some of the components of this experiment. He's adding, he's doubling the amount of virus. And with the doubling of the virus, you can see there's a doubling uh, of the counts per minute. So this suggests that um, when you increase the virus or when you double the virus, the amount of DNA you get out is also doubled. Uh, but then if you do a negative control, that is if you don't add any uh, deoxycytosine or deoxyguanine, then you're back to baseline, you, you're almost undetectable. So the conclusion is that something is converting this RNA component into DNA. Um, and then that something is dependent on the virus, right? If you add more virus, then you get more DNA. Um, and therefore, there must be an enzyme or something inside the virus that is contributing to uh, the conversion of RNA to DNA. So this uh, led to the Nobel Prize in 1975. Uh, it might seem like a pretty simple experiment, but at that time, it was pretty revolutionary. The idea that you can go from RNA to DNA um, was only proposed and kind of um, actually uh, blasphemous uh, given, uh, given the central dogma at that time. All right, so let's go through some review. Uh, this will definitely be interactive. Um, how do you get DNA from DNA? In other words, how, how does replication work? What, what do you need? What enzyme do you need, guys? Somebody knows it. Come on. You can put it in the chat. You can say it. What enzyme convert, copies DNA into DNA? Anybody? There's 20. It's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. There's 23 of you here. Somebody's got to know it. <laughs> here. There we go. Okay, so in the chat, DNA transcriptase. Yeah, pretty close. Um, it's, it's actually uh, the the name is a uh, polymerase, uh, basically cop uh, copying uh, DNA. Um, the thing I wanted to uh, let's see the chat. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> good try, good try. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I appreciate that you're participating. Absolutely. Um, the thing that I want to get across is that it's a DNA, so the official name is a DNA dependent DNA polymerase. And what that means is that it's using DNA to make more DNA. Right, so there's a, so as I'm going through this lecture, there's going to be a lot of different polymerases that I'm going to go through that some of you probably haven't heard of. So this is, I just want to get this concept down. down. Um, that is, it's using DNA, it's DNA dependent DNA polymerase, making DNA to use, uh, using DNA to make DNA. All right, follow up question How do I get DNA to RNA? Which enzyme here? This is a great review, too, because we've got the, you know, the AP test coming up on May 18th now. So this is all stuff that we've covered that they should have, that they should know. So hopefully they can answer this one, too. How do you get DNA to RNA? There it is. Yes. Yeah, RNA polymerase, very good. And so again, a little bit more specific. I know you guys probably just learned RNA and DNA polymerases in class, um, but specifically, this is a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Um, that is, it's using DNA to make RNA. So you see this pattern. I'm trying to use co color coding to get the visual learners um, more visual prompts, I guess. Um, okay, lastly, how do I use, how do I get RNA to DNA? And someone, someone said the answer for this earlier, but. Oh, somebody knows this one. Reverse transcriptase. Yeah, exactly, very good. Reverse transcriptase. Um, so that's kind of like the common uh, name we use for reverse transcriptase. Um, but the kind of the more lengthy, wordy description of this enzyme is, RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So if you kind of look at this pattern, you can see that it's using RNA to make DNA. Um, it's a DNA polymerase, uh, but it's RNA dependent. So th this pattern, if you don't learn anything from uh, this lecture, um, just trying to like visualize and understand the dependency part and then the polymerase part. So the polymerase part is what you're making, and then the, the dependency is what you're uh, using the copy or, uh, yeah, what you're using to copy the copy the DNA or RNA. So I'm gonna uh, come back to this color coding scheme in a little bit. 
All right, so why do I care about this? So after David Baltimore discovered uh, reverse transcriptase, he won the Nobel Prize, but he didn't just do that. He also generated infectious molecular clones, um, which is kind of what we use in everyday virology now and also Baltimore classification. So earlier I said, there must be an easier way than like the kingdom, phylum, um, et cetera, classification. And indeed there is. And so what he came up with is the uh, Baltimore classification. And so he thought of it as, how do we get RNA? Uh, that is, how do we use RNA to generate protein? And viruses come in all sorts. And so I'll go through each of these later, but kind of, uh, he imagined all the different possibilities. So you can have double-stranded DNA, kind of similar to eukaryotes and um, bacteria and things like that. You could have potentially single-stranded DNA. Um, you could have double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA. And the uh, sixth one is in the instance of reverse transcriptase when you go from RNA to DNA. And so he imagined a functional classification. That's the key thing I want you to understand. This is not really based on um, uh, like sequence analysis. It's not really based on um, the classical uh, models of taxonomy, but it's mostly based on functionality. How do different viruses produce proteins, which is uh, which produces function? And so let's just go through the each of these classes one by one. So class one is the simplest. Uh, this is what you guys are most familiar with. This is a these are double-stranded DNA viruses, and so. This undergoes a, a normal uh, order of production of protein. That is, you go from DNA to RNA to protein. So this is similar to what you experience in a eukaryote cell. Um, and so some examples of these are herpes viruses. Um, so herpes simplex, uh, Epstein's virus, virus, Kaposi sarcoma virus. Um, these also include adenoviruses. So these cause the common cold, pneumonia, causes some GI excuse me, uh, some GI um, uh, illnesses, and then also pox virus. In general, these are uh, the most complicated of the viruses because they have large genomes. Their genomes are double-stranded, and they're, uh, they usually produce a lot of uh, genes and proteins. Class number two um, is the single-stranded viruses. And so these are similar to double-stranded, but they just start off as single strand and then they um, kind of produce a second strand with, after infection of a cell. And these use, again, the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase uh, for their replication. So you're using DNA to make more DNA. And then, and then after that, they can go through the normal production of protein that is from DNA to RNA to protein. And these are, some examples of these are bacteriophages, um, ocean viruses, parvovirus. So this is a childhood illness, um, kind of uh, produces some freckles on your face and uh, chest as a respiratory disease. <clears throat> so classes one and two, these are what you guys are probably most familiar with um, in terms of uh, the order of things. Class six are the special ones. So these are your retroviruses. Um, you guys are familiar with this. These are uh, viruses that use reverse transcriptase. So they start off as RNA viruses in the particle or RNA genomes in the particle. And then they use reverse transcriptase to get DNA. And then after DNA, they can um, either integrate into the cell or uh, to produce protein, they go from DNA to RNA to protein. So this is similar to classes one and two, um, but just with a reverse transcriptase uh, step. And again, this, uh, this reverse transcriptase the other name for it um, is your RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So it's using RNA, it's dependent on RNA to make more DNA. Now, as I'm going through these different classes, I don't think it's that important to memorize the numbers, one, two, three, four, five. I think the thing that you should take away is that there's different classes and they're based on how they produce uh, protein and how they replicate. So understanding that there's differences is gonna be the most important part going forward. Class seven is um, also similar to class six. Um, these are what we call para-retroviruses. Um, these are a little bit funky. Um, they use double strand, they have a double stranded genome, but they use an intermediate reverse transcript, uh, transcription uh, step. So they to make protein, they go from DNA to RNA to protein, similar to class one and two. But then 
the RNA can also be used uh, to make DNA uh, using a reverse transcription step. And this is how they uh, regenerate their genome. And an example of this is hepatitis B virus. Uh, so that is visually depicted here. So they start off as DNA, they can make protein, they make RNA and then protein, uh, but then they can also go through reverse transcription. All right, you might ask me, this is stupid, Adam. Um, why, why don't you just make DNA from DNA? And so that would make sense, right? If they have a DNA, DNA genome, why don't they just go through normal DNA polymerase? And that's a little bit uh, difficult to ask. Does anyone have any uh, post postulates or any um, ideas on why we might want a intermediate reverse transcription step? This is kind of a higher level question. Why don't we just make DNA from DNA, but why, why do we have this intermediate step? That just makes things confusing. You guys think, can think about it for a second. Any guesses, anybody? <clears throat> I think that's an excellent question. Why wouldn't they just make more DNA from DNA? That doesn't, <clears throat> yeah. No worries. This is, again, this is kind of like a higher level question. I don't think anyone really has the answer, um, but one good hypothesis is basically balancing uh, rates of mutation and adaptation. So on the left, here's a diagram of kind of on the x-axis, you have your genome size, um, and then on the y-axis, you have mutation rate. And so what, they're, what this is trying to show is that as your genome size gets bigger, the mutation um, rate uh, decreases, you know, this is an inverse uh, uh, log scale. Um, and so things on the left-hand side, these are usually smaller, they have higher rates of mutation. These are your RNA viruses. Um, things that are bigger, things like eukaryotes and multicellular life, these have larger genomes and they have smaller mutation rates or lower re mutation rates. And so we know that retroviruses have very high rates of uh, mutation. Um, and that's due to reverse transcriptase. And that enzyme is not a very good enzyme. It makes a lot of errors. But for small viruses, having a lot of errors might be uh, beneficial um, because as you're infecting your host, um, there's this pressure for adaptability. That is, how do you overcome the host immune response? And then there's this like negative pressure from the mutation load. So if you have too much mutation, that's bad, right? If you have too much mutation, then the virus can't replicate, um, but you want some amount of mutation so that you can adapt and change more rapidly and overcome whatever immune barriers that um, you're infecting. So kind of retroviruses have high mutation rates. Double-stranded DNA viruses I mentioned are similar to, they're large, they're, um, they have very low mutation rates. So potentially one explanation of this class uh, seven uh, viruses is they're balancing the uh, the genome size of the double-stranded DNA viruses, but they're increasing the mutational frequency to have to be more fit um, in terms of their evolution. That's just one postulate. There's probably lots of other hypotheses out there, but this is kind of um, a visual representation of mutation rate as a function of genome size. All right, back to our different classes. Does that make sense? Any questions? Uh, this is kind of like a higher level. Uh, concepts. Um, if you have any questions, uh, you can let me know and I can pause. Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, so now we're getting into some more interesting uh, viruses. So these are our RNA viruses, classes four and five. Um, they are just single strand on RNA viruses. They go straight from RNA to protein. They do nothing else. They don't have any, uh, any DNA intermediate step. So now you might be asking me, but Adam, how do, how do these viruses replicate? Right, how, how, do I get D, uh, how do I get RNA from RNA? Does anyone have any, any idea? What would I use to make RNA from RNA? Which one of those en enzymes that he talked about before? Anybody? 
Come on. We got, let's see. RNA polymerase again. Yes, very good. Yes, and someone specified RNA dependent. Excellent. Excellent, exactly. So uh, basically, uh, so the for for these RNA viruses, what they use is an RNA dependent RNA polymerase. That is, they use RNA to make more RNA from it. And so this is probably something that you haven't learned from um, AP biology. I don't know if you guys have covered this yet, but this kind of just falls into the pattern of the different types of polymerases there are. There's DNA dependent DNA, uh, DNA polymerases, there's RNA dependent DNA polymerases, there's uh, now we're introducing the concept of RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase part is what you're making, and then the RNA dependency is um, what you're using to make it from. All right, so um, the replication schema of these viruses are pretty simple. Um, RNA, as you know, can go directly into proteins. Um, so that's how they create the proteins to make the envelope and their functional uh, proteins. And then to replicate, they also include in, encode this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and then that's how they replicate their genomes. Um, we can differentiate them into positive strand and negative stranded viruses. So what that means is that positive strands, they can just go directly from RNA to protein. For the negative strand, they have to go, this is the negative strand. Uh, what I mean by that is the, the opposite strand of the coding strand. So they have to do a replication, a transcription step, and then they can um, do translation. So this step uses that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Um, and then, yeah, so uh, this is just going through the replication. All right, uh, and then another visualization. So if you have a negative strand to make the positive strand, you use the same enzyme, and then to get the genome back and again, you use the same um, polymerase. So this polymerase can work on both, uh, both strands of the RNA. All right, so what are some features of class four and five? So these are by far the most abundant viruses in, uh, in nature. Um, they compose uh, of the realm of ribovirium. Um, so some examples of these, so you have your coronaviruses, these cause uh, things like hepatitis, A, poliovirus, enterovirus, so these are uh, nasty uh, gastric bugs. They cause um, arthropod-borne illnesses, so these are mosquito-borne illnesses like West Nile, Zika, um, which I think you guys have heard about in the news a couple of years ago. Um, Toga virus, this causes a disease called chikungunya. It's a tropical disease that's not really common in the U.S. And then, of course, coronavirus. Um, that's what we've all been hearing about the last couple of months, um, and it's probably why you guys are all at home. <laughs> uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit, and then class five are some other um, viruses, uh, such as influenza, rabies, Ebola, um, some really scary uh, viruses. Um, now, Trivia time. So now this is going to shift over to kind of the more real life aspects. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a lecture on coronavirus. Um, trivia time. Does anyone know what corona and coronavirus mean? What, what does corona mean? If you were sitting on um, the beach having a corona, let's see, chat. No. Hang on. Yeah, very good. They better not be having coronas yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm <yeah>, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, so it means crown, it comes from ancient uh, Greek, and so if you look at the electron microscopy image of the coronavirus, you can see how this kind of looks like the solar corona or the crown of, um, of the sun. Uh, so that's where the name derives from. Um, uh, some more trivia time. Uh, coronavirus, COVID, SARS, SARS, COVID, COVID. Um, so many times, what, what's the difference? So let's start with, uh, Cove and coronavirus. Um, so Cove is the abbreviation for coronavirus. Um, it's a common name for the family of coronaviruses. So this is um, copied from the ICTV website, um, and this lists every single uh, species of coronavirus of the family coronaviridae. And so it includes 39 species like beluga whale coronavirus, which I don't know is abbreviated whale Cove FW1, um, and then 
down here you can see that um, SARS coronavirus is right here. This is a severe acute respiratory symptom related uh, coronavirus. Um, and all right, so let's talk about SARS. So SARS stands for severe acute respiratory syndrome. So this is a disease, um, and the a virus that causes it is SARS-CoV. So S-A-R-S-C-O-V. Um, this was uh, responsible for the 2002-2003 pandemic. Um, it was similar to the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we are currently undergoing, um, but it was at a much, much smaller scale and it kind of resolved by itself. SARS-CoV-2, uh, this is what we're currently dealing with. This is the virus that's driving the current pandemic. Um, and again, the abbreviation for this is a star severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus, the COVID part two. This was formally called 2019 NCOV, uh, but since um, sequencing data has showed that it's very, very similar to the 2002-2003 virus, we renamed it uh, COVID 2 So actually this is um, I think 82-83% uh, identical um, to this previous uh, pandemic virus. Um, now, distinguishing this from COVID, so COVID is the disease. Um, so I've tried to get, again color code everything, um, and COVID stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. So <clears throat> the SARS-CoV-2 is um, the virus causes the disease. This is confusing. Yes, what are you doing? WHO? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> kind of just purple, uh, COVID, whenever you see COVID or SARS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2, think uh, that this is a virus. Um, for other things like SARS, COVID-19, this is the disease. So SARS-CoV okay. SARS -CoV was the 2002-2003 one? Is that? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so that's uh, 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 the first for the 2002-2003 uh, pandemic. Yep. Okay. All right, so why do we care about those? Well, obviously, you guys are staying at home right now because of increasing rates of infection. Um, this was pulled from the CDC April 4th, so uh, two days ago. Um, and you can see that numbers in the US are rising um, kind of at a linear rate. Um, if you look down here, um, as of April 14th, 300, there were 304,000 uh, confirmed cases. Um, and this doesn't really have any signs of decrease. So. The reason you're staying at home is <clears throat> to try to prevent or slow down this rate of infection. So have you guys heard of like uh, flattening the curve? I'm, I'm sure you guys have all heard of this in like social media. So what this means, you guys know this already, but without protective measures, the rate of infection is going to go up. Um, and this dashed line is kind of our healthcare system capacity. It would kind of overwhelm it. Um, this is kind of what's going on in Italy right now and um, uh, less extensively, but uh, still pretty um, substantially in New York City right now. But if we were to try to uh, flatten this curve, we could potentially slow this process down and give our healthcare system uh, ability to uh, treat patients with um, COVID-19. So let's go into depth about this. So uh, how many of you have heard of r not? We at, they should have all heard of it because we just did okay. an assignment. Like, <laughs> we just did an assignment on it last week. Okay, so you guys have all heard about it. Did you guys go into like the details of what, what it's proportional to? Not specifically, no. Okay, so uh, there's kind of like three components of r not. So the first component is transmissibility. So this is a, a um, this is a, a, a well, I guess, uh, this is inherent to the virus and different viruses have different rates of transmissibility. So you can think of this as um, how infectious um, a virus is and I was trying to look at how transmissible uh, the SARS-CoV-2 is. I couldn't find specific information, probably because it's so new, but this is very well studied um, in the bacteria field, especially for foodborne um, pathogens. So here is just a, a diagram pulled from the uh, um, US Food and Health Administration. Um, on the x-axis is a log scale of dose, so basically how many bacteria there are, so uh, specific numbers. And on the x-axis, or sorry, that's x-axis, the y-axis is a different bacteria. So you can see that on the left-hand side, if you just ingest 10 particles or 10 bacteria of E. coli, uh, this, uh, this pathogenic one, or Shigella, you will become 
infected and you will develop symptoms. So you're gonna get vomiting, diarrhea, all that nasty stuff. Um, same with like tuberculosis. If you, I think the actual number is like maybe like two spores. If you, if you inhale two spores of uh, tuberculosis, um, you're, you're gonna become colonized with tuberculosis. So th this is extremely infectious. You can compare this with like listeria. This requires 10 to the third, so like a thousand um, bacterium of listeria. Um, and then <clears throat> things like uh, Yersinia, Streptococcus, <clears throat> so this causes strep throat. It's also on, on a higher level. <clears throat> so the differences in uh, kind of the infectivity depends a lot on one, uh, whether or not the particle, uh, the bacteria or virus is infectious. And secondly, um, especially for viruses, whether or not they were produced correctly. So when you think about viruses, they replicate within a host cell, right? They can't replicate on their own. So there's uh, par parts of uh, the virus are floating around inside the cell and somehow they have to all come together and they have to assemble into a particle and then they have to leave the cell. Um, and sometimes that assembly process is a, 100% um, efficient. And so you have a lot of viruses that are produced, but a lot, not, not all of them are infectious. Similarly, you can have production of virus and they make it to a part of your body that is not susceptible to infection, right? So if you have SARS-CoV-2 on your hand, you're not gonna get infection through your hand, right? Your skin is a barrier and that virus cannot penetrate through it. But what you can do is you can uh, move that virus from your hand to your mouth, your nose, and then that uh, gets introduced to your epithelium, your nasal and um, oral epithelium, and that is susceptible to infection. So that's kind of the transmissibility part. Transmissibility we cannot change. This is inherent and unique to each virus and bacteria. What we can change are the second two parts. So the second component of r naught is the average rate of contact. So this is how often you come in contact with another person that's infected. Um, and uh, it's not only how often, but how long you're in contact with them. So this is why you guys are all at home. This is why there's stay at home orders. If you can decrease the rate of contact, um, then you can decrease this R not. But it seems very intuitive, right? If you're not in contact with an infectious person, then you can't get infected. But this is a very important concept in limiting this uh, pandemic. So um, no contact is um, the best, but if you can't have no contact, then limited contact is uh, the next best step. And then the third part is the duration of infectiousness. So this is how, this is what we call like an incubation period or, or how long you can produce virus and be infected. And so for all viruses, oops, well, I guess my animation didn't work. <laughs> For all viruses, there are kind of uh, different, uh, uh, there's different uh, periods of um, symptoms. So there's an initial asymptomatic period and then there's a symptomatic period. And so on the left-hand side, this is just a probability curve. Um, basically for SARS-CoV-2, this was published about a, two weeks ago or a week ago. The average asymptomatic period is about five days. Um, so that means, Within the first five days, you, you can still transmit to other people, but you're asymptomatic. And then after five days, you're more likely to get uh, symptoms. And so actually, people have done calculations. The probability of you transmitting SARS-CoV-2 to another person while asymptomatic is 37%. So that's almost, that's more than a third of all individuals will be asymptomatic when they're transmitting this virus to another person. So you can be feeling totally fine and still transmit it to another person without knowing it. So that's the kind of the second important part of why you guys are all staying at home, not only to limit the contact, but to limit the uh, duration of infectiousness so that you're not exposing other people while you feel fine. Oh, this is my animation. So take on points, one, stay home. Take on point number two, just because you're fine, um, doesn't mean you're not infected, and then wash your hands and um, cover your mouth. I don't know, there's probably like a lot more things that you could do to prevent this, but I think these are the most important um, in, in terms of um, slowing down this pandemic. Is that, uh, is that uh, a high probability um, compared to other viruses? It seems like it would be, but I don't have any 
point of reference. Uh, oh, you mean the thirty-seven percent? Yeah. Um, I actually don't know either. I think it's pretty high. I think for other viruses, uh, this um, incubation period is a lower. So, like, um, for like the common cold, it's about like two days. Um, uh, for influenza, I think it's like three to four days. Um, and so there's a lot, there's definitely a lag time for all viruses, but, um, this one, uh, SARS-CoV-2, I think was a little bit higher. I, I, I should, I don't know for certain, um, I can get back to you on that though. Okay. Okay. All right. So that's kind of, um, my little just on, um, COVID and SARS-CoV-2. Um, finishing up, there's just two more slides. Um, the last slide, um, the last classification of viruses is class three. These are your double-stranded RNA viruses. Um, and you can imagine that these are similar to class four and five, but they just have two strands of RNA. Um, and the way these work is that uh, one strand um, uh, makes protein, and then the other strand um, is used for um, replication. So it gets copied over to make more of its genome. Um, and that's kind of it for the Baltimore classification of viruses. Um, it's simplified uh, in this slide. Basically, you can have DNA viruses where DNA gets turned into more DNA. You can have RNA viruses where RNA is used to produce R more RNA. Um, and then you ha can have your funky ones here, um, ones that use reverse transcriptase where they uh, undergo uh, reverse transcription of RNA to DNA, and then they use DNA to make uh, proteins. Um, and then here's just some some of the common ones shown here. I think this is a nice summer slide. I can slide, send the slide deck out to you guys. Um, if you guys are interested, you guys can look at this and have some fun. All right, um, so that kind of concludes my uh, lecture um, for the first part of the Baltimore classification of viruses. Basically, there are seven classifications. They are fun, uh, they're classified as how um, viruses function, which I think is a lot more easier to remember than uh, remembering like 400 genuses and 100 families. Yeah. Once you know that um, there's, once you know the way they replicate, then you can understand how they can function. All right, any questions before I move on to, I, I'll, I can like talk a little bit about my career path if you guys are interested in. I can take questions at this time about um, the lecture material. I think it's been an hour already, so we're kind of a little bit long time. Um, but this was in, this has been really interesting for me, um, hearing all this stuff. Plus, being your student instead of your teacher, I kind of <laughs> kind of switch roles is interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, guys, go ahead. If you have questions, unmute yourself um, or type them into the chat. Um, this would be a great time to ask questions that uh, came up uh, while you were while you were listening. Um, but maybe, maybe Adam, if you want to go ahead and talk about the visit your the career path and while they and then they can start typing some questions or you know they can raise their hand. Oh, there we go. There's yeah, sure. Let me see. Uh, how long do you think this pandemic will last? Okay, so that's a really tricky question. So um, if we were to rely on data from like 2002, 2003, which is the previous um, SARS pandemic caused by SARS CoV, I think it's just SARS CoV. There's no one um, that. Uh, virus kind of dwindled down by itself. It kind of had a lull in the summer and then the fall and came back again, but then the next cycle, it didn't really come back. And that's probably due to its uh, lower R0 value, and it was a little bit more limited geographically. It didn't have this much spread this fast. Um, but given that, like, uh, for SARS-CoV-2, it's already widespread in pretty much every nation, and it's um, significant numbers globally, I think it's going to have at least uh, one potentially another uh, cycle. So I think there will be a lull later this summer, but I think maybe in the fall, once um, the weather gets a little bit colder, it'll be more, um, it'll circulate again. Um, and potentially we might have another um, cycle. It might not be as severe this time around because we'll be better prepared, but it might be around for a couple cycles. That's my um, thought. I don't know if that's correct. In terms of like the immediate future, um, I think there's modeling predictions that uh, end of April, mid-April will be the peak in terms of infected individuals. And um, at that point, it'll kind of uh, trend downwards. Now, those infected individuals will still um, be recovering and they'll still be infectious. And so 
Um, it'll be a couple months after that before things die down, I think. So yeah, that's a really good question. And the honest answer is no one, no one really knows. This is a novel virus. Um, we can do our best at predictions and modeling, um, but it requires a lot of research. Yep. As a physician scientist, are you still able to practice medicine like working with patients while conducting research? Yeah, exactly. So uh, let me go through some of these slides. So what is a physician scientist? So a physician scientist um, aims at trying to combine both medicine and research. Um, and this is like a definition that I like, um, but they are physicians who are devoted, uh, who devote regular components of their professional efforts seeking new knowledge about health, disease, or delivery of patient care through research. And so it really combines the humanistic nature of medicine that is treating patients with like the scientific inquiry of researchers that is trying to develop new um, therapies and um, information to treat um, human uh, diseases. Um, I think it's a little bit uh, unique because um, there are of course a lot of researchers and they do a lot of really great research. A lot of them do basic biology, they understand our natural world, <clears throat> but specifically for physician scientists, they're aimed at trying to improve medical illnesses. And again, there's a lot of great uh, doctors and a lot of great physicians out there, um, but a lot of them, uh, most of them are using existing knowledge to treat our patients. So physician scientists try to combine both of these fields. Um, some information about training programs, um, some, some benefits um, and uh, some downsides. So benefits, um, tuition is uh, free for the medical school and you get a stipend. So uh, there's some economic incentives. Um, but I think the more important thing is, is that there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in both the medical and research components. So you can uh, still go through any type of uh, residency training for medicine. You can, be a P, uh, you can go into pediatrics, you can go into OBGYN, you can go into internal medicine, surgery, um, you can go into ophthalmology, you can do basically any type of medicine still, and you can do any type of research um, pertaining to medical illnesses. Um, long term, there's um, really great funding success if you want to do research. Um, and then you get this mindset of like the physician scientist. So what I mean by this is um, you think of problems in terms of how you can benefit uh, medicine and how you can benefit uh, the treatment of individuals suffering from um, illnesses. Um, downside, it does take a long time. Um, <laughs> there's like the stresses of both I joke at this, but there's the stresses of both MD, which is like a lot of exam taking, and PhD, which is a lot of existential crises of like not knowing what you're doing. Um, <laughs> uh, it's pretty competitive, um, and it's a little bit uh, time intensive in terms of your future career. And then long term, salary is less than a typical MD because they're doing research on site, um, and that pays generally less than an MD. So it's kind of like averaging out the salaries of the MD and PhD, but still like significantly more than. Um, like average household, I would say. Um, so you so those are kind of, you finished your PhD last year, is that right? Yep, yep. So um, and then how kind of this these programs work is that um, uh, there's uh, MD PhD programs which are usually eight years. They're split kind of in half in terms of the medical school training. You do two years of medical school, then your PhD, and then the last two years of medical school. And the rationale for this is that. During the first two years of med school, you learn all the information. So you, you, this is all the knowledge-based learning. And then with this kind of baseline knowledge of medicine, you're trying to take this information and apply it to your research. So you're trying to discover something new um, that's relevant to human disease. And then you go back into medicine and finish up your last years of med school um, in the clinic. And so that's where I'm at right now. I'm on uh, year seven of eight, um, just about done with my uh, MD part. And then after that, you can do residency, you can still do postdocs, and then um, long-term uh, physician scientist. Now, of course, you don't have to do an MD PhD program. There's a lot of MDs um, that are successful physician scientists. You can do an MD and a PhD separately. You can do an MD and then just do a postdoc later on. There's a lot of different uh, career paths. Okay, but you're 18, right? Or 17. Um, how can you think about your life and like 12 years, that's like, half, that's like your entire life basically, or like three fourths of your life. Um, I don't really expect you guys to think about it right now, but 
since you guys are thinking about going to college or about to go to college, I thought I might finish with um, some college advice. And um, mainly one is to have fun. College is a lot of fun. You should go to like sporting events, parties, clubs, whatever you want. Um, second, you should try new things. Um, I think this is very, I think this is the, the best part of college is that there's so many things that you don't experience in high school, um, especially if you go to larger universities. There's such diversity. Um, that's where I learned about anthropology, where I had never heard of the term anthropology before. Um, you can travel. Um, it's also a time to make mistakes. Um, and what I, mean, what I mean by that is that not like try to go make mistakes, but if you do make a mistake, it's okay. Like if you think you want to go into uh, medicine right now and then uh, you become a junior and you're like, wait, I don't want to be a doctor. That's okay. Like you didn't waste three years of your life. You use that three years of life uh, making an important mistake and understanding and fixing that um, is a really valuable lesson. And I think it's definitely okay. If you're a junior and you don't want to go into medicine, don't go into medicine. Um, conversely, if you're a third year uh, in college and you were thinking of going to journalism and you realize I don't want to do journalism, um, go ahead and switch. Don't be afraid to switch. Uh, fourth, study hard, but not more than you need to. I think this is really important. This is coming from like a really big nerd in high school um, and in college. I think Graba can attest to that. I, I was like the kid that brought my own stuff to uh, biology and chemistry labs because I don't like <laughs> the stuff at school. Uh, yes. But, <laughs> but what I mean by that is that you should study uh, to do well in class, but not more than you need to. Like go, thinking back um, to high school and college, I studied probably really hard in some classes I don't need to. Like um, there was this class I remember about like Japanese literature. It was extremely difficult. I spent way too much time in it in college. Um, and six years down the road, I don't remember anything I learned in that class. Um, and so this, this might be a little bit different than when, what you hear from like your parents and teachers. I don't know, but you should learn the material. Um, but more important than just knowing, you should understand that knowledge. If you understand something, then I think you'll be able to retain it better. So that's what I hope to kind of emphasize in this lecture. Um, not really knowing the specific details of those classifications, those Baltimore schemes, but understanding why we have it. So it's a, it's a reflection of how viruses replicate and whether or not they depend on RNA or DNA to replicate is important um, for their function. Um, and then for some people who are interested in medicine, these are some um, specific advice. But I think that's all I have for you guys. Um, if you guys have any other questions, I'd be happy to take them now. If you have any life questions, I can help you answer those or try to uh, give you some advice. But that's kind of um, all I have for you guys. Thanks for listening. That was that was outstanding. Um, I learned some stuff there there today. So um, I, I, that was really well done. The, you know, you did a great job preparing and putting this together. That was that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking your time, giving us your time, and and um, explaining all that to us. Do yeah, you guys, definitely. Yeah. Do you guys have questions? Any other questions about anything that was it was covered today? If not, maybe just a thank you would be good, and, and you guys can get on with the rest of your day. Whatever it is uh, that you've got um, is is awesome. Um, so, um, yeah. All right. So I think we're – all right. So they are – you guys are listening to – listening. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions uh, later on, feel free to contact me. Um, this, maybe Mr. Graber can send this out and then um, if you want I have like a little short um, survey if you guys want to fill it out on what you thought um, if you don't want to it's just like uh, 10 questions really short. Um, okay. Is that is that in the um, is that this? Yeah, right. yes. Okay. Yeah I can send that to you maybe you can uh, send yeah. it out Mr. Graber. Yep absolutely if you yeah send it to me and then I'll put that link um, on Schoology for the kids. Uh, All right. so That's they can fill it out for you. It's the least they can do for you giving all that, all that time and effort today. Um, so, um, well, uh, 
All right, guys. Um, you guys are free to to take off if you don't have any questions. Um, I don't. I think those were all just uh, thank you. Right? Was there any questions that anybody? Uh, had? No, I think it was just uh, okay. All right. Um, yeah. So you guys are free to go if um, if you're all done and don't have any questions. So. All right. Um, all right. Take care. Thanks. All right. Yep. All right, Adam, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate uh, all Yeah, the yeah. No, this was fun. It, it was really, really well done. Um, really well done. So um, you should hopefully other, maybe, maybe some other people will contact you to do the same thing for their classes if, <laughs> if you have time. All right, sounds after, good. Yeah, yeah. After I share this out, I don't know um, if that's something you'd be willing to do, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there would be other teachers around the around the country that might be interested in uh, something like this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I have, like I said, I have a ton of free time right now. I don't have anything <laughs> scheduled until July. So this is uh, pretty fun for me. Um, I also learned some things about researching um, uh, COVID and things like that as well. Yeah, no, and all those, all those, all those data tables and, and graphs that you put in there um, and visual representations are so important for our AP kids to see to understand how to read them, um, mm -hmm. not just for the AP test, but, f you know, cause they for sure will have stuff like that on the AP test, but just for, for going forward um, in their careers and in, in future in science that a lot of these guys are interested in. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was great um, to see all those and see that, oh yeah, no, it's not just Mr. Gray, but it's crazy to <laughs> try and interpret all these graphs. So oh, yeah. it's actually useful and used. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so thank you very much, man. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Uh, let me know if there's any other things I can do for you. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. All right. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Yep. Bye. Bye.